The Colonial Parkway is meant to provide a beautiful glimpse of nature to travelers who are exploring some of America's history in Virginia. However, it turned into a hotspot for violent, vulgar murders, which are popularly known throughout true crime today. Join us as we talk about the mysterious case of the Colonial Parkway murders. Hey listeners, welcome back. I'm Brittany. And I'm Hallie. And we are so excited to have you back with us. We have made a lot of changes since the last episode. We moved halfway across the country. We're settling into our new apartment. We're stressed out of our minds. (laughs) But we knew that we still had to get you all the true crime content. So here we are again to bring you another story. All for you. (laughs) And this one's actually pretty cool because I lived in Virginia for a lot of my life. I've lived in a lot of different places in Virginia. I went to college in Williamsburg. So this one is near and dear because I've been to all these places. I've driven past all these sites that we'll talk about many times and you've been there too to visit a couple times. Yeah, I don't know if you guys know, but Brittany and I are pretty avid travelers. We like to go around and explore new places and so Brittany went and showed me a bunch of areas in Virginia that were really cool and beautiful and I even got to ride exactly where we're talking about today and past even some of the crime scenes. We love all our dedicated listeners that tune in for every episode, but if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you listen on and give us a five-star rating on Apple. You can like us on Facebook. You can follow our Twitter, Instagram. Don't be afraid to hit that share button either. (laughs) And of course, with every episode, we'll have a post on our website, theabysspod.com that will have lots of pictures and all of our sources more information that you can go check out and anything like that. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube if you want the episodes that way. We have a really good community of people that listen on YouTube and comment with their thoughts and different updates and information like that. So that's pretty cool if you want to join that. And for all of our YouTube covers, we even add some of the pictures from the case. So while you're watching the video, you can also see some of the people we're talking about as you're listening. And if you would like to support the show a little bit more, we do have a Patreon now where you can donate a couple bucks a month and help us out. So let's dive into the abyss. The Colonial Parkway is a 23-mile scenic drive throughout Virginia, and it connects the historic triangle. So that's Williamsburg, Jamestown, Yorktown. And construction for this road started back in 1930, and it would actually take them 26 years to complete this, which isn't abnormal. As we all know, construction takes forever, (laughs) even with modern equipment. If you ever drive 95, you know that. (laughs) It was built specifically with a focus, though, to preserve its history and to enjoy the nature and the beauty around it. Despite the efforts to create such a beautiful and safe parkway, it became an ever-growing crime scene. The first victims in the Colonial Parkway murders were Kathleen Thomas and Rebecca Dowski. We will refer to them as Kathy and Becky. And the information on their case is super abundant because Kathleen's brother has just dedicated so much time and energy into this case. Kathy actually had three older brothers, and they really pushed her to be the best that she could be. She was known as hardworking, intelligent, and compassionate. These traits just assisted her in her academics and her athletics, where she just thrived. Kathy's father and brother both served in the Navy. And in 1976, the U.S. Naval Academy started to accept women. Immediately, Kathy knew that she wanted to follow in the steps of her father and brother. She was part of the second ever co-ed integrated class in the U.S. Naval Academy, which was from 1977 to 1981. Her family was the first ever to have a father-son-daughter trio attend the Naval Academy. Because of this, Kathy had to push through a lot of hardships and obstacles that were presented during her time there, definitely because she was a woman and just because being a student causes a lot of its own stress and pressures as well. Kathy was first stationed in Norfolk, Virginia as a logistics officer. There were many barriers that had to be broken and she was a very strong-willed and determined girl, as we said, so she was determined to make her place. 
She really wanted to make the Navy her career, but the times were making it extremely difficult and complicated for her. For starters, there were very limited positions for women in general at this time, and she was a lesbian, which wasn't really accepted back then, so she had a lot of speed bumps along the way that were making it hard for her to get through. As hard as it was for Kathy, she ended up leaving the Navy after five years. She moved over to Virginia Beach, and she got a job as a stockbroker. She started to make plans to obtain her master's degree in Washington, D.C., since she had an ultimate goal to work for the State Department. This would provide her with the opportunity to use her language skills, as well as other things that she had learned in the military. Her life seemed to be working in the right direction, and she even fell in love with a woman named Rebecca Browski. Becky was originally from Poughkeepsie, New York, but she had gone to school at Dickinson College. She later decided to transfer and moved to attend William and Mary in Virginia in order to study business administration. She was known to be super athletic and fun, and this really matched up with Kathy's personality, as we have mentioned. She had two jobs working as a clerk for her school, as well as a daycare attendant for two-year-olds which props to her because been there, done that. (laughs) It was during her time at William and Mary that she met Kathy and really formed a strong romantic relationship. They had only been dating for six months when October strolled around. On October 9th, 1986, 27-year-old Kathy and 21-year-old Becky decided to go out to dinner. Becky was going to be heading home to visit her mom for fall break. And she would be gone for five days. So the girls wanted some quality time together before she left. And they decided to have a nice night out in Williamsburg. Which if you haven't been to Williamsburg, old colonial Williamsburg or anything like that, it's gorgeous. They finished up working on a project with friends at William and Mary and then went on their way. The following day, Kathy failed to show up for work and didn't call. And this was really strange. She was a very punctual and upstanding person, so she wasn't really one to just flake out. And she didn't call anybody. She didn't alert any of her friends that she'd be gone or anything like that. Also, Becky missed her final class before break, and this was super strange because she had been working so hard on a huge project that was due at that class. So it would have damaged her grade a lot to just not show up for that class, and her friends knew that this was not like her. Out of concern, they went and looked for her, and they actually found her car in the same spot that it had been the day earlier, and it was all packed up with her stuff for her trip. She was ready to go, but she was nowhere to be found. Two days later, a passerby, some accounts say it was a jogger, some say a father and son passing by, but in any case, someone saw Kathy's white 1980 Honda Civic down an embankment about 35 feet from the road. At first, emergency responders thought that it was just a terrible accident, but it really soon became clear that this was not the case. Becky's body was laid across the back seat and Kathy's body was shoved into the hatchback. Upon examining the bodies, the coroner found that both women had meat in their stomach contents, so this indicated that they had made it to a restaurant and were probably on their way home when they pulled off the road for whatever reason. Both women had been dead at least 24 hours, and both had been strangled before having their throats cut. Kathy had actually been cut so badly, she was nearly decapitated. She had defensive wounds, showing that she put up a fight, which really aligns with her character of what we've heard that she was not one to just go down without a big fight. She also had a clump of hair in her hand, likely from her attacker. There was a piece of cut nylon rope found sort of behind Kathy's hair and there were orange carpet fibers on her body as well. Police believe that the girls were killed outside of the car and then put back into it. It didn't really look like they had been killed in the car, even though there was a significant amount of blood in the car, but it looked like they had been sort of placed there after they had been killed. There was no sign of sexual assault on either woman, so it was hard to find a motive in that. The car was examined as well, and it was apparent that the killer had attempted to set the car on fire. This crime, as brutal as it was, didn't look like it was by someone who really had a good handle on what they were doing. The killer had poured gasoline over the car and tried to light it on fire. And according to Bill Thomas, Kathy's brother, the killer did this before the car was pushed down the embankment. So while it was still at the top of the hill, they tried to set it on fire and then that didn't work. So then they tried to push it into the water and it got stuck in some brambles before hitting the water. 
so that attempt failed as well but honestly there's nothing really they could do at that point to obscure the car so i'm sure they just took off after that for such a gruesome murder the killer seemed really scatterbrained and all over the place which seems abnormal because you have to be pretty confident to go attack two women yeah and To make it even stranger, nothing was missing from the car. So robbery wasn't really considered a motive. Like I said before, there was no sexual assault, so it wasn't a sexually motivated crime. And Kathy's wallet was in the car and open as if she was getting something out. So this made police think that maybe the killer had impersonated a cop or maybe was a cop or law enforcement of some kind and had pulled the girls over and as she was getting out her license and registration and all that, this person attacked. There were cigarette butts scattered around the scene, but they couldn't really conclusively be linked to the crime. Lots of people just throw trash everywhere, and so it's hard to connect it, especially because DNA testing wasn't really very developed then, so none of that really made for good evidence. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be too long before another murder took place. In fact, it would only be about a year later. David Knobling and Robin Edwards were in a romantic relationship. However, it wasn't exactly legal because David was 20 and Robin was only 14. Robin was considered a free spirit and her friends knew her as very vibrant, kind, and loving. At one point, Robin ran away from home and was out of school for a few weeks. She would often talk to her friends about this boyfriend she had and how he was so much older than her. She seemed to just be really head over heels for this guy. However, This boyfriend, David Knobling, also had a long-term girlfriend who was newly pregnant. So for David, Robin was more of a side fling. In September of 1987, Robin and David decided to sneak away for some time alone. On September 21st, David's car was discovered at the Ragged Island Wildlife Refuge, close to Smithfield, Virginia. The driver's side door was open and the window was partially down, which stuck out as abnormal to officers because the night of their disappearance happened to be a rainy night. The keys were in the ignition and the radio was playing. David's wallet was open on the dashboard and their underwear was found in the trunk, but there were no signs of the bodies. Two days later, on September 23rd, David and Robin's bodies washed ashore in the James River about two miles from where they had found David's car. David was about 30 yards from Robin and both were partially clothed and had gunshot wounds to their heads. David was wearing a belt that was unfastened and Robin's bra was also unfastened and around her neck. It was a mystery what happened to these two and the case remained unsolved. The next incident came a little less than seven months later. On April 9th, 1988, two students from Christopher Newport College, which is now Christopher Newport University, 18-year-old Cassandra Lee Haley and 20-year-old Richard Keith Call were headed out to a party for their first date. The following day on April 10th, Keith's father happened to be driving by on his way to work and spotted Keith's red Toyota Celica in an area overlooking the York River on the Colonial Parkway. This was about three miles from where David and Robin were found. He noted empty beer cans and Cassandra's purse in the car. The driver's door was cracked open, but Keith's father just assumed that Keith and his date were taking a walk and that they'd be back. Being on his way to work, he didn't really have time to stick around and just wait and see when they came back, so he just sort of wrote it off and went on his way. About an hour later, a park ranger pulled up to the car and made a report. His account was a little bit different than Keith's father. The ranger said that Keith's wallet was in the car and the glove box was open as well as the driver's door. Keith's clothes were folded and put in the back seat and Cassandra's purse along with her bra, a boot, and her and Keith's underwear were also present in the car. And in Cassandra's purse was another man's wallet with about $12 in it. Cassandra's wallet and jewelry were missing. Later, it came out that the ranger had actually been at the car earlier that day, even before Keith's father came by. He had looked through the contents of the car and took some IDs and things like that to see if he could determine whose car it was. At that point, he just kind of thought someone abandoned the car or someone was off doing something they weren't supposed to be doing. So he took some things and tried to figure it out. After Keith's father left the car, the ranger came back thinking maybe this was more than just an abandoned car. So he put everything back the way that he found it and he was just too embarrassed to admit this later. It's unfortunate that it was 
handled so much because we know how important it is to preserve evidence and who knows what could have been messed up by him doing that but and if we know not to disturb a crime scene you'd think the officer knew not to disturb a crime scene (laughs) some people think this was more than just ineptitude some people think that this added more evidence that someone in law enforcement was committing these crimes because it could have just been that he was making sure that his fingerprints would be over the car or maybe he took other evidence or something like that. Some people thought this was even more proof that it was something malicious, not just not just being bad at your job. Keith and Cassandra's bodies were never found and have never been found to this day, but police ruled it a homicide. The last official murders that are tied to the Colonial Parkway murders are of two individuals named Anna Maria Phelps, who was 18 at the time, and Daniel Lauer, who was 21. Daniel was a really good friend of Anna Maria's boyfriend, and since Anna Maria and her boyfriend lived together, they were allowing Daniel to move into their apartment with them. While working on the move during Labor Day weekend in September of 1989, Anna, Maria, and Daniel vanished. No one knew what happened to them or where they were. And the only thing they found was Daniel's car. It was found at a rest stop off of Interstate 64 between Richmond and Williamsburg. The keys were still in the ignition and Anna Maria's purse was still present. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? Because it does to me. Police brought out search dogs to attempt to locate a trail. And they assumed maybe the two of them had walked into the woods, but... Unfortunately, the scent went nowhere. Helicopters were even brought out to do an aerial search of the location for three days, but they came up empty-handed. A month after their disappearance, two hunters ended up stumbling upon skeletal remains, and it was later confirmed to be Anna Maria and Daniel. Due to the advanced decomposition that they were in, it was really hard to determine their cause of death, but they were able to tell that each had been stabbed. After assessing the multiple crime scenes, it was suspected that the perpetrator was either in law enforcement or pretending to be. This would make sense with the people having their wallets out, windows down, keys in the ignition, and their doors open. Even though these four double homicides seem closely related, it is also suspected that maybe they were done by different people. This would make sense too if it was a copycat. We all know that copycats happen pretty often and that would make sense for the slight differences in some of the murders. And honestly, that's somewhat more terrifying to think that multiple people in such a small area are capable of such outlandish behavior. So like we said, even though those are the only four murders that are attributed to the Colonial Parkway killer, some speculate that there were even more victims than that. And there are many cases that have been kind of tangentially linked to it. One case that could possibly be related is that of Donna Hall and Mike Margaret. 18-year-old Donna was described as a kind and outgoing person that made friends easily. And 21-year-old Mike was friendly and loved the outdoors, especially driving to the Outer Bank. And he worked at Virginia Power. On August 17th, 1984, about two years before the murders of Kathy and Becky, Donna and Mike were planning to leave for a camping trip. Mike left work early that day and swung by Donna's to pick her up. And then they went back to his house to pick up some camping equipment. And then they went to a friend's house to pick up the tent. So they were driving around a lot that day. They hung out at this friend's house for about an hour before making their moves towards the campsite. On August 21st, a man was walking his dog and found the bodies of Donna and Mike near Mike's Jeep in a wooded area behind Donna's apartment. Neither of them had been seen in four days. There was blood spatter found in the car and there was a blanket spread out beside the Jeep and some of Donna's cigarette butts were scattered around. And don't forget, we have a lot of pictures from these cases on our website, theabysspod.com. So be sure to go check that out so you can kind of get a good visual on what we're talking about. This one in particular has a lot of pictures associated with it. So be sure to go look at those. Police say the bodies seemed posed, but not in a way that really denoted a calling card. Both Donna and Mike had multiple stab wounds and their throats were slit. Mike also had defensive wounds and Donna was not wearing shoes and they couldn't find shoes anywhere in the crime scene. So they weren't sure if maybe for some reason she left barefoot or if 
someone took off with her shoes or what really happened with that. But it was pretty odd that they were planning on going camping and she just didn't have shoes. I hope we don't have another Jerome Brudos on our hands. <laughs> Police also stated that it was likely that the couple was murdered at the scene because Donna was clutching pine needles from that area of the environment in her hand. There were three types of blood found at the crime scene, so the killer was likely injured. We know that with stabbings, a lot of times the killer's hand can kind of slip on the knife and they can injure themselves that way. So it's not uncommon in that kind of crime. Unfortunately, it had rained for three days, so the scene was heavily contaminated and a lot of evidence was just washed away pretty much. Kind of ironic how that keeps happening. It's raining at the crime scenes. There's evidence contaminated. Hmm. Mike and Donna had a lot of money on them, which was assumed to be related to drugs. The area they were found in was a known place where people would buy and sell drugs. So it could have been that they were looking to score some drugs before they went on their camping trip. Or maybe they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. We really don't know. The medical examiner believed that the time of death was about 1 to 2 a.m. on the 18th. Both Donna and Mike had Demerol in their system, which is a narcotic sedative. Police looked for Demerol dealers in the area, but the case was never solved. Police continue to get tips about this case to this day, and some people really believe this is part of the Colonial Parkway murders, but a lot of people also think that it may have just been drug-related or just something just completely separate. Another case that people tend to connect with the Parkway murders is the case of Brian Craig Pettinger, who was 25 years old at the time, and he had worked for a security company in the area called Ron Little's Advanced Security Firm. This is going to be important, so make sure you remember Ron Little's Advanced Security Firm. <laughs> Brian was a good worker, but he left in early 1987. Brian was last seen at a nearby nightclub, and then on February 1987, he was found in a marshy area of the James River in Suffolk, Virginia. He was only clothed, he was only clothed in a white, he was only clothed in a dress shirt and socks, and his hands were bound. He had been severely beaten in the back of the head, but the cause of death was determined to be drowning. In connection to another case was a woman named Lori Ann Powell. She was 18 years old and considered to be very vibrant and strong as a woman. She competed in Miss Gloucester and Miss Teen Virginia pageants. And after graduating high school, she worked for a few months at, once again, Ron Little's advanced security firm. This was more towards the end of 1987, even though it was the same year that Brian Pettinger worked, he left the company at the beginning of 1987 and she joined at the end. Still a crazy coincidence. Yeah, you're right. It is quite crazy. And we will talk about how it gets more crazy in a few minutes. So hang on to the edge of your seats, folks. <laughs> she later quit her job at Ron Little's advanced security firm and she started working at her mom's video store. Lori Ann had a boyfriend of three years named Chris Cutler. This relationship was very, very toxic. It was said that they fought often and she even started carrying a knife on her at all times for protection. She was a fighter and was always prepared to protect herself. On March 8th, 1988, Lori Ann and her boyfriend were in a car on the Colonial Parkway when they got into a very bad argument. Chris stopped the car and dropped her off alone and in the dark on the side of the parkway around 11 or 12 at night. This is absolutely absurd. He literally drove away and left her on the side of the Colonial Parkway at night by herself. Never is that okay. Chris Cutler returned about 40 minutes later to, I guess, pick her up or check on her. I don't know why you would even leave her in the first place and why it even took you 40 minutes to turn your butt around and go get her. But she was gone. He searched for her a little bit just by driving around and he couldn't find her anywhere. So he just left. About a month later, on April 2nd, 1988, Lori Ann's body was found at the James River, same as Brian Pettinger. She was nude and she had multiple stab wounds in her back. Joe Ann, Lori Ann's mother, spiraled into a very deep depression after her daughter's murder. In 1998, she went on to the Oprah Winfrey show and she met with Dr. Phil to discuss her daughter's death and her own personal struggles that she had had after the fact. 
She confessed that she was planning on committing suicide before the show, but that Dr. Phil helped her change her perspective completely. And we're going to play that audio for you now. What is it you want to say about your daughter? That Lorianne was a person, that she deserved to live, that she didn't deserve to be thrown away like a bag of trash. <laughs> they threw her away in the river like a bag of trash. And she didn't deserve that. What did it do to you when they took your little girl away from you? It ended my life. I no longer wanted to do anything. I don't want to feel joy or happiness. I don't want to <clears throat> smile. They destroyed me. I know this is a terrible thing to say, and I have tried in my heart, I really have, to forgive. <laughs> But I hope they're in the same hell I am. I hope they're suffering just like I am. I hope every day for them is just as bad as it's been for me. If she could talk to you right now, do you think she would say, Mother, I want you to hurt every day for the rest of your life to prove that you loved me? Oh, no. Do you she think that's what she would say to you? She would be very angry at me over this. So it wouldn't be a betrayal. Maybe the betrayal is focusing on the day of her death rather than celebrating the event of her life. Mm -hmm. She lived for 18 vibrant and wonderful years, and you focus on the day that she died. I never thought of it that way. I really never thought of it that way. And we ask her, tell me what's going on with you right now. I thought after I would made this goal, that now I could go home. I'm sorry. I was going to go home and take my life. And in that moment, in looking in her eye, you knew there was no melodrama. This woman was deadly, deadly serious. You can really hear how much she's hurting. And we'll even link the video on the website so you can visually see her. And we really recommend you go look at it because the moment where it just the light flicks on in her head and she switches her perspective is a physical change. You can see it all over her face, just written. Yeah. Cue the waterworks. It definitely made me cry to watch her. I know we were sitting in the middle of a Starbucks watching this while we were working on our research and we both started getting watery eyed. You can really see and even hear the weight taken off of her shoulders. It was a beautiful way that they helped her truly. And Joanne even started a nonprofit organization to support other people who've lost loved ones due to violent crime. Now, if you remember, both Laurie Ann Powell and Brian Pettinger worked for Ron Little at his security company. I'm about to drop the mic, ready? Ron Little was also a Gloucester County Sheriff's deputy. Ooh, now I think we've been speculating this whole time that a police officer could have been behind it. So this is very interesting that he's connected to two of the victims. He actually started an investigation into the murders of Brian and Lori Ann because he knew them. Now, I'm not saying he's guilty, but it looks a little fishy. Also, another turn of events Robin Edwards, who was the 14-year-old seeing the older man and was murdered, also had a connection to Ron Little because her mother worked for his company as well. So this is a total of three victims that he could have had a connection to. Mike dropped. <laughs> <laughs> Another crime that was suspected to be connected to the Colonial Parkway murders is that of Julianne Williams and Laura Winnens. And this is a pretty popular case when talking about Kathy and Becky's case, um, to be like associated with that one. Laura, known as Lolly, was 26 years old in 1996. She had come from a very well-to-do family, but she really rejected the wealthy lifestyle. She didn't feel like she fit into that. And to make it worse, she had gone through some sexual abuse as a child. So she was really working through that trauma and developing her own identity throughout her life. She found tremendous solace in nature. She loved being outdoors and she worked really hard to be independent and follow her bliss. She dropped out of college soon after starting and later decided to move to Maine where she enrolled in Unity College and there she really thrived. She loved music. She liked local microbrews and like we said, she loved the outdoors. Me and her probably would have been friends. 
She loved being outside so much that she became a wilderness guide for work. She was described as passionate and a great friend. Julianne, who went by Julie, was athletic and super smart. She was 24 years old in 1996. She loved geology and she really liked helping her community. She struggled to reconcile her Christian faith with being a lesbian, but she was learning to be confident in who she was and really just accept herself. She worked in a bookstore in Vermont, but had really exciting opportunities on the horizon. She was set to start a new job in June and was super excited for that. Julie and Lolly both signed up for a trip through an organization called Woods Woman that brought women who love travel and outdoors together. And this organization doesn't exist anymore, but we were both talking about how we really wanted to find something like that too. Yes, it would be so much fun to meet a bunch of people in your community who share that same interest because it's such a dominant interest. The two girls were put in a tent together on their first night and spent the whole time talking and laughing together. They found kindred spirits in each other and began a relationship shortly after this. They really bonded over their love of the outdoors and got along really well. On May 19th of 1996, the girls decided to backpack through the Shenandoah National Park with their golden retriever Taj. That night, they set up camp about a quarter mile from the trail. Park regulations stated that camps couldn't be visible from the trail, so that's kind of why they were off the trail a ways. About 12 days later, Julie's dad was starting to get worried. He hadn't heard from the girls. He knew they should have been back by then, and it's pretty scary, especially when they're out camping. There's a lot of things that can go wrong, so he decided to report them missing so the park rangers would set out to find them. Julie's vehicle was found near Skyland Lodge, so the rangers kind of used that as a focal point for their search. And on June 1st, the campsite was found, and unfortunately in it were the bodies of Julie and Lolly. Lolly was found in the tent. She was bound and gagged with duct tape. Her legs were tied together with thermal underwear, but there was no sign of sexual assault on her. Julie was in her sleeping bag, but she was about 75 feet from the tent. She was naked and also bound and gagged but there were no signs of sexual assault on her either. It did appear that she had been tortured, though. Both of the women had their throats slit. There was no sign of a huge struggle at the campsite, so police think that the women had either been ambushed or that maybe there were multiple attackers. Male DNA was found on the thermal underwear that was used to bind Lolly's legs, but the sample was kind of degraded, so it didn't do him much good. Two hairs were also found. One was on a glove a little ways from the scene, and the other was stuck to the duct tape used to bind one of the women. The hairs didn't have roots, so DNA was really difficult, especially at the time. Time of death was also hard to determine, but it was estimated to be around May 26th to the 28th, but there was some evidence that the time of death may have been much earlier than they thought. The women had a camera with them, And the timestamps on the last photos taken with this camera were on the 24th. They also were planning to change campsites each night of the camping trip, but they were still at their first one there and no one had seen them since the 24th. So there's kind of a lot of evidence that they met foul play that first night. The national park was under federal jurisdiction and some believe that they didn't really put everything they could have into this case and sort of let some things slide, which there again, we have another case where it was potentially mishandled. The park was really busy, and even though the entrances had cameras, thousands of people had come and gone, so it was really hard for them to track down everyone that had been there and get statements from them and all that stuff. People were coming from all over the country, maybe even all over the world, so it was pretty difficult to get everyone back in one place. The FBI did state that there were quote-unquote substantial similarities between Julie and Lolly's case and that of Kathy and Becky. There's the fact that it was a lesbian couple, that their throats were slit, um, things like that, no sexual assault. So there were a lot of similarities between these cases. Now, obviously, with so many murders and so many crime scenes, there are a galore of suspects that have been looked into by law enforcement. There was an unnamed ranger that was suspected due to the fact that he just patrolled the area at night in the dark a lot, (laughs) but he passed away in 2008. They also looked into a fisherman in the area who had, quote, 
strange sexual habits, end quote. They also suspected Becky's boyfriend could have been responsible, but he was not named, and we really couldn't find any other information on that. They also looked into a man named Fred Atwell. Fred had been a felon and served time for a burglary, but he was ironically allowed to join the police force as a deputy in Gloucester, Virginia in 1981. Seems like that shouldn't happen, but, you know, I guess I don't make the rules, so people do whatever they want. In 2009, Fred brought 84 photos from various crime scenes that were being mishandled. Some of them were being used as training for a security company in the area, and some had been leaked to news outlets. This struck me personally as really interesting because some of the photos were being used as training for a security company, while Ron Little owned a security company, and he was also a sheriff's deputy in Gloucester, Virginia, which Fred Atwell was also a deputy in Gloucester, Virginia. So it seems like they would know each other and seems to be that they are mishandling information. I don't know. Those connections haven't quite pieced together how it would work, but it's definitely strange that there are so many with the two of them. Fred Atwell bringing up these photos brought the case back into view for the FBI and they started looking into it in depth again. Fred really dove headfirst into the Colonial Parkway murders and started involving himself with the investigation and even through supporting and even through support of the family. However, things took a turn for the weird when Fred started lying to the family. He told Kathleen's brother, who had been very involved in the case, if you remember, that he was talking to some attorney out of the country and that he had more information about the murders and so on and so forth. Fred told Kathy's brother that the attorney's client wanted $20,000, 20K, to tell them where Keith and Cassandra's bodies were located. So you're telling me that this attorney, so-called attorney, knew where the bodies were, but was trying to blackmail them to get money, which just seems really off to me. Like, I like to think that an attorney wouldn't blackmail somebody. So obviously Fred was lying in order to get money himself and was trying to do this by taking money from the victim's family. That reminds me of the Amy Lynn Bradley case with the private investigator that kept taking money from the family and saying like, oh, I found her. She's over here, but we need more money to get her. Oh, they're over here, but we need more money and just kept extorting the family like that. And it doesn't end here. Fred seems to be a very greedy money hungry individual because in 2010 fred atwell set up a fraudulent raffle ticket where all of the money went to a fake account for the victims of the colonial parkway murders fred ended up taking the money but the police were unable to determine exactly how much he had managed to gather from this fake fund shortly afterwards he held his wife at gunpoint for robbery and then he ended up back in jail and a year later he was sent to jail again for robbing a woman Supposedly, he ran out of the woods, said he lived in the woods and was hungry, then stole her purse and ran away. So it sounds like he was on something. He was tripping. I don't know. Something was going on because he had a few bolts loose. Overall, they consider Fred Atwell to be a suspect, but there's no confirmed evidence to prove him to be the perpetrator. Another major suspect in these cases is Daryl David Rice, and this is a wild one. It gets kind of convoluted, so bear with me here. He had a very sordid past and a very long history of just hating women, basically. He was not only a strong suspect in Julian Lawley's case and the Colonial Parkway murders, but also other murders as well. He was also a suspect for the Route 29 stalker, which we'll talk about in a minute. So he was tied up in a lot of bad stuff. Like I said, this gets kind of convoluted, so stick with me on this. They won't all be in chronological order, just to kind of explain a way that fits into the more broad story, but Daryl's web is very tangled, so there's a lot to unpack here, and we wanted to give you the best picture that we could of who he was. Daryl was single, he had no kids, and in 1996, he was fired from his job for frequently yelling obscenities at female co-workers, 
they claim that he would push coworkers and make them spill their coffee and steal things from the office. So all around, just not a great guy to work with. Probably should have been fired on the first or second <laughs> time. Yeah, the fact that he has a string of <laughs> reasons that he was fired is a little concerning, but... Maybe assaulting a coworker should have been enough. <laughs> you would hope. In July of 1997, he was driving down Skyline Drive when he came upon Yvonne Malbasha. She was riding her bike, just kind of enjoying the scenery, and he pulled off the road behind her and started screaming obscenities at her. He tried to grab her and force her into his car, but she was a badass and fought him off. He got back in his car and actually tried to run her off the road a couple times, but she evaded him by getting behind a guardrail and a tree and basically just preventing him from running her over. And I can't imagine that scene because obviously he was just insane. So that must have been really scary. Eventually, when he couldn't run her over, he just drove off. And Yvonne immediately contacted rangers and they headed him off at a park entrance. He was wearing a different shirt and where the truck didn't have any license plates when he attacked Yvonne, it did now. So this showed that he was trying to evade being identified and that showed a lot of premeditation, which is scary for such a erratic person. It's scary to think about what may have happened to Yvonne if she did get pulled into the car. Yeah, actually police found restraints in his car, so he clearly had some pretty bad plans for her. He pled guilty to the charges and was sentenced to 11 years in prison. And during the interviews with Daryl about Yvonne's attack, he made comments that made police take a second look at his involvement in other crimes. They took a really hard look at Julian Lawley's case again. They found that Daryl had been seen at the Shenandoah National Park on May 25th at 8.05 at the Front Royal entrance, and then again on May 26th at 4.57 p.m. at the Rockfish entrance. On June 1st, he was with friends at the park, and Daryl admitted to being at the park on June 1st, but denied that being there the earlier date. On April 10th, 2001, Daryl was indicted on four counts relating to Julian Lawley's case. These included charges for hate crimes because they had determined that the crime likely occurred because the women were lesbians. The evidence was solely circumstantial. There were no forensics and Daryl had a really good defense team. They sought to really tear apart the case that was against him. And in 2003, the hair from the campsite was finally tested and it was found not to match Daryl, which pretty much ended the case against him. And the charges were dropped without prejudice in 2004. And without prejudice means that they could go back and try him again if more evidence came up. But at this point, they just dropped all charges. That's definitely not solid evidence that he didn't do it because that hair could have come from anywhere, honestly. But it was enough to sort of end that path to try to convict Daryl on it. The FBI is still investigating that case, still gets tips and everything. So hopefully at some point we'll get good updates on that. But as of now, there's nothing being actively pursued. But this was not the only time that Daryl's name came up in an investigation. If you remember me mentioning the Route 29 stalker, that's a whole nother set of cases that have been connected to him. To explain this, we have to rewind to before Yvonne's attack back to early 1996. Many women reported a man signaling them to pull off the road as they drove down Route 29. Some ignored him while others stopped. He would honk and flash his lights and all of that as if something was wrong with the women's vehicles. To those he stopped, he told them that he saw sparks coming out from the bottom of their car and offered to drive them to a phone to get help. Three of the over 20 women that reported this happening agreed to get in his car. Two of these women were dropped off without incident, but one, Carmelita Shomo, was not so lucky. On February 23rd, 1996, she was driving home from work when a man driving behind her started flashing his lights, signaling her to pull off. Initially, she thought it was her husband or maybe someone that she knew, so she did pull off the road, but found that a stranger was approaching her car. He said 
the old story sparks were flying out from under her car and he even rattled off some reasons this could have been happening and said the car was really not safe to drive he sounded like he knew what he was talking about so carmelita became pretty scared at the condition of her car and agreed when the man offered to drive her to a phone she hung a white piece of cloth on her car to show distress and then they drove off the man said his name was Larry and the two chatted a little bit, but soon Carmelita noticed that Larry was acting pretty squirrely and started getting off vibes. She asked to be dropped off and the man then became enraged. He grabbed her by the neck and forced her head into his lap and held a screwdriver to her neck. A struggle ensued and somehow the passenger door became open Carmelita managed to get out the door, but before she could jump out of the car, her foot became tangled in the seatbelt, and the man drove off and dragged her a little bit before she could get untangled, breaking her ankle really badly as she fell. She yelled for help on the side of the road, but no one stopped. All the cars just drove past her, but eventually a ranger that lived nearby heard her and ran to help. Carmelita didn't speak English well, so at first it was assumed that her husband attacked her, so police didn't put a detective to investigate her case until the next day when she finally got someone to understand what had really happened. Another woman that could have possibly been connected to Daryl Rice was a young woman named Alicia Showalter. Alicia was a fourth-year graduate student in the pharmacy program at John Hopkins. Alicia started driving to Charlottesville one day to meet her mom around 11 o'clock in the morning in January. When she didn't show up, her mom got worried and called Alicia's husband, Mark. Mark told her just to be patient and give Alicia a little bit more time. By 1130, Alicia's mother, Sadie, still had not heard from Alicia. She was getting even more concerned, and so she called Mark again. But he was studying and missed the phone call. After about two and a half hours, Sadie decided to call her husband, Harley, and he phoned Mark until they were finally able to get through. All three of them became panicked since Alicia was nowhere to be found, and Mark immediately called the police, and Sadie got in her car and drove to Route 29 to search for her on the road. Sadie drove and drove and even stated that she felt like she should have kept driving, but she ended up turning off of Route 29 onto 33 and headed back home with no further news. At 1.15, someone stumbled upon Alicia's credit card and called it in. Only five hours later, they found her car abandoned. On March 2nd, someone found Alicia's parka, which caused the family to become more and more concerned about her safety. Distant family started migrating into the town to support the immediate family of Alicia, and to help search for her. On March 7th, a man noticed that some buzzards were swarming overhead, and he decided to check it out and see what's going on. It was there that he discovered the body of Alicia Showalter. She had been decomposing for two months, so it was really hard to determine the cause of death. 10,000 tips came in, including some about Daryl Rice. Just to keep you guys up to date on the timeline, this was just after Julie and Lolly were murdered. Daryl was younger than who they were expecting, but after Yvonne was attacked and identified Daryl as the perpetrator, he went to prison for his actions against Yvonne. He also came forward with details about Carmelita and Alicia's cases. Daryl admitted to taking pleasure in running women off of the road and harassing them. In 2002, Carmelita officially pointed out Daryl Rice as her attacker and even testified to this in court in 2005. During the proceedings, Daryl maintained his innocence but took an Alford plea deal. He was still released in 2007 on parole with a tether, only serving 10 out of the 11 years that he was sentenced to. Two years after his release, he admitted that he violated parole by using drugs and watching pornography and he was sent back to jail for nine months. Even though Alicia Showalter's case, the Route 29 stalker, and Julian Lolly's case match closely with Daryl Rice, they are still considered to be unsolved. Several other names came up over the course of the investigation, too. Richard Evanitz, a serial killer active between Florida and Virginia, was suspected. 
Richard served in the Navy and received a Good Conduct Medal. He served about eight years before leaving. But in January of 1987, Richard exposed himself to a 15-year-old girl. He was arrested a month later and pled no contest. And he received three years probation. He was also suspected of a 1994 abduction and a 1995 rape. Between 1996 and 1997, he abducted and killed at least three girls. On June 24, 2002, he abducted a 15-year-old girl named Kara Robinson in Columbia, South Carolina. He raped her and tied her to his bed, but while he slept, she escaped and identified him to the police. He fled and eventually killed himself, but because he was an active serial killer in the area, he has been looked at in relation to the Colonial Parkway murders, but there's really no evidence that conclusively links him to those crimes. Another suspect was John Walter Ball. He was a state trooper until he was forced to resign after a really weird incident where he tried to steal a salt and pepper shaker from a restaurant and the restaurant owner asked him to leave and he caused a big scene about it. So it's kind of strange. Must have been some pretty nice salt and pepper shakers. (laughs) Later, he was shot to death while trying to rob a store. He was considered because of the theory that the perpetrator was law enforcement, but again, there's not a lot of evidence to support this theory. Jesse Ronald Walling was also looked as possibly being involved. He was an unemployed heavy equipment operator with a violent temper. He had raped and killed a woman by slitting her throat, and this murder occurred near the Colonial Parkway. And while he was in jail for this murder, the Parkway murder stopped. So that cast some suspicion on him because as soon as he was out of the picture, they stopped. But other than that, there's not a whole lot to link him to them. The final suspect we are going to discuss today is Michael Nicolou, private investigator and founder of the reunitepeople.com, Lynn Marie Cardi, believes that Michael is 100% responsible for the murders. Lynn Cardi and a reporter named Ben Montgomery worked together to compile evidence against Michael and to find out about his past. Michael was an army veteran and he admitted to killing 30 civilians while in Vietnam. And he even stated that he would leave camp just to quote unquote hunt humans. But the charges were dropped for some reason. Not quite sure why. When Michael returned back home from the military, he ended up opening up a porn shop. I guess this might have been a passion of his. Who really knows? But he sure did. After this, the evidence against him started kind of piling up and it gets pretty intriguing. It appears that wherever he lived, there were also serial killings occurring as well. When he resided in the New England area, there were serial killings referred to as the Connecticut River Valley Killer. This case is insane, and it's just a whole other can of worms. If you are interested in the case, there is a ton about it, but we won't go into detail today because it's just so hefty. Basically, between 1978 and 1987, there were about six women killed. If you are interested in us going over this case, please send us a message, or you can even contact us through our website, theabysspod.com, and let us know. But we're going to kind of keep it where it is at the moment, since so much is going on with the Colonial Parkway murders on their own. However, when Michael moved to Virginia, the killings in Connecticut stopped, and the killings in Virginia began. Lynn Cardi believes that Michael had an accomplice at this time. He was also married to a woman named Michelle, but he was extremely abusive and controlling, and he would follow her wherever she went. She tried to leave, but was unsuccessful. She finally told her parents that she was concerned for her safety and that she was going to leave for good. Her mother went by their home to check on her in December 1988, and the apartment looked abandoned. The baby toys were just scattered everywhere. There was spoiled food in the kitchen, and it was thought that the kids were possibly with Michael. Michael started referring to Michelle as a slut and said that she ran off with another man, but this didn't really fly by so easily. Police were highly suspicious about Michael, but they really didn't have any evidence, so nothing came from it. Michelle's mother ended up hiring Lynn Cardi to find her daughter, most likely because she was suspicious of Michael as well. Michael got married a second time to a woman named Eileen. No shocker, he was, again, extremely abusive and even broke her shoulder. In 2005, Eileen fled with her daughter so that way they could get to safety and they ended up resting in Tampa, Florida. 
Michael followed them there and dressed in a dark suit. He took a guitar case that was full of guns and then shot Eileen and her daughter and then himself. In 2010, the FBI reopened the Colonial Parkway murder case because they were able to test a lot of the DNA that had previously not been able to be tested. Also, some of the families had asked a retired homicide detective named Steven Spingola to look into the case. After doing his research, he believes that there are two people responsible for the murders. In 2018, the police said that they had DNA of a potential suspect in three out of four of the official Colonial Parkway murders. This is a huge deal, but the testing is going to take some time to process through. The reward for information about the killer or killers is up right now to 20 grand. We scoured the internet to find all the details of the Colonial Parkway murder to clear up all the questions we had in our minds, but we came out with more than when we started. Were these crimes the work of one person, or is there more to the story than meets the eye? Thanks for jumping into the abyss with us. Which are popular, let me just restart, okay. Who was nearly, p- nearly pregnant. <laughs> she was getting there. <laughs> throw, throw. <laughs> Better catch. Straighten it. <laughs> Volleyball, back to you. <laughs> Soccer kick. 